Welcome to this episode of Mentors at Your Benchside, the podcast giving you advice, tips and tools for getting the most out of your research. I'm Ava Amson and today I'll be talking to you about protease inhibitors, why they're needed, how to use them safely and how to store them correctly. Proteases are present in all living organisms. They break peptide bonds in proteins and are involved in a multitude of cellular processes and pathways, ranging from simple to complex. Without them, your blood wouldn't clot. Apoptosis, the process by which cells turn over under normal conditions, would cease to occur. Pepsin and trypsin would fail to help us digest tasty protein-packed meals. Worst of all, you might not be able to get stains off your clothes because proteases are a common additive in many laundry detergents. All joking aside, proteases are clearly essential for cells to function normally. That's all fine and good for life as we know it, but proteases can be a major pain in the neck when it comes to expressing and purifying proteins in the lab. Whenever you lie cells, the compartmentalization and inhibition that keeps native proteases in check is broken and you unleash potential havoc on your precious proteins of interest. So why are proteases a problem during cell lysis? Cell lysis disrupts membranes, including those that sequester proteases, which are carefully kept in check by the cell during normal metabolism. After that barrier is lost, whatever proteases your cell line expresses are free to begin work on the rest of the free proteins in solution. Adding protease inhibitors as a component of lysis buffer means that you can have a preventative measure ready to go even before cell membranes are ruptured during the lysis process. Even if you're unaware of the diverse array of protease inhibitors that exist, odds are you've used at least one or two of them if cell lysis is a typical part of your work. I'm looking at you, EDTA. Now we know why proteases are needed, let's look into how they work. Protease inhibitors aren't a family of molecules related by structure. Rather, protease inhibitors are defined by their function. They inhibit proteases, as their name implies. Technically speaking, protease inhibitors include any chemical or biological compounds that bind to proteases to inhibit their function reversibly or irreversibly. Their size and molecular weight vary widely, and the classification includes small chemicals, peptides, and even other proteins. Protease inhibitors can be classified in many ways. When you shop for protease inhibitors, you'll find that they're often grouped by the type of protease they inhibit. However, we can classify them broadly based on whether they are reversible or irreversible inhibitors. A reversible inhibitor binds to an enzyme's active site through non-covalent interactions. A good example of a reversible protease inhibitor is aproteinin, which inhibits most serin proteases by competing with a natural substrate for the active site. For reversible protease inhibitors to work well, you must ensure that an appropriate concentration of the inhibitor is used so that it can effectively outcompete the natural protease substrate. In other words, your precious proteins. Conversely, an irreversible inhibitor binds to the active site in a manner that prevents function permanently. For instance, E64 is an epoxide that covalently modifies the active site cysteine involved in the nucleophilic attack in cysteine proteases, rendering the protease forever inactivated and unable to split any future peptides it would have otherwise chopped up. Within these two groups of protease inhibitors, there's a big range in affinity for various proteases. Thankfully, most common protease inhibitors have suggested working concentration ranges and their mechanisms are well understood by the scientific community, making your life easier when it comes to selecting inhibitors to use in your work. Having a solid understanding of how individual protease inhibitors work provides a firm foundation for their use, even if you decide on using a cocktail, most of which includes some combination of the most common protease inhibitors. Now, in the article, which you can find on our website, so if you look at the episode description, there's a link, the article has a table that lists the commonly used protease inhibitors in the lab with their targets and working concentrations. And it includes information on AEBSF, aproteinin, bestatin, E64, EDTA, lupeptin, pepstatin A, and PMSF. 
But wait, how do we select a single magic bullet protease inhibitor that will prevent all proteases from degrading proteins in our lysis workflow? The fact is, there isn't a protease inhibitor that will inactivate all known proteases. Single proteases are often used when the goal is to remove tags from already purified proteins. In most other instances where broad action against native proteases is desired, a cocktail of several protease inhibitors will do the trick and are a popular option. These cocktails come prepared as concentrated solutions or even sometimes as convenient tablets. Most commercially available cocktails come as a combination of six inhibitors. AEBSF, A-protonin, Bestatin, E64, Lupeptin and Pepstatin A. With the addition of EDTA, a broad-acting cocktail covers nearly all your bases in most cell lysis and purification workflows. EDTA is typically suggested as optional as it can interfere with certain experiments. Cocktails are an especially convenient, cheap and reliable means of inhibiting proteases and are very popular in labs. Refer to your supplier's data sheets and protocols to decide on the amount of a cocktail to add to your lysis buffer. Now there are some things to keep in mind when deciding to use a protease inhibitor in your work. The first is storage. Several protease inhibitors are especially unstable when kept at room temperature or even in refrigerated conditions for prolonged periods of time. Furthermore, the stability of protease inhibitors varies at their working concentration. As long as you store inhibitors appropriately and according to vendor directions, however, they should function as intended when you're ready to use them. One exception to this is PMSF, which may require multiple additions to keep proteases at bay. Another consideration is safety. While most protease inhibitors are recognized as generally safe with standard microbiology lab PPE, there are some special cases. Some inhibitors are prepared as concentrates in organic solvents and acetic acid. PMSF acts as a neurotoxin and should be handled in a fume hood. The bottom line is always review the safety data sheet on any new reagents you use in the lab, including commercially available protease inhibitors. And the final consideration is compatibility with your workflow. While several protease inhibitors target certain classes of proteases fairly specifically, there are cases where you may want to exclude certain inhibitors that are not suitable with downstream activities in your work. For instance, EDTA is an excellent metalloprotease inhibitor because of its ability to chelate divalent cations that metalloproteases require in their active sites to catalyze proteolysis. But EDTA will also strip the nickel off protein purification columns that are often used to purify histagged proteins. Other protease inhibitors do not function at extremes of pH or temperature. So, generally speaking, you'll probably get off to an excellent start by consulting the instructions provided with protease inhibitors from vendors, including how to best handle and utilize your inhibitors of choice. So, that's it for our overview of protease inhibitors. Check out the episode description for links to related articles and resources. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get more help and advice from mentors at your bench side.